Yeah, I gotta move pretty fast. But you know, I've I got it on YouTube now. So if you look, you can find it, and it wasn't too bad. I don't think the recording was too bad, but uh, we'll see if it makes a better recording today because we have the sound system, and also I moved the, uh, the microphone, I moved the camera a little closer. That's the camera I stole from my wife. Actually, she's let me borrow it. She has no use for it. But uh, if you see, am I on there? Can you see me? Yes. And the, then that's a good. That's positive. Yeah, Last time I cut my head off uh, in one of the classes I was teaching. But I'm going to try to put all the classes on YouTube, and that way you can go back and review them. If you go to YouTube and look up Lionel Alford, you should find it. If you go to lionelalford.com or ldalford.com and select Educator and look for this class, it should have all the, the YouTube videos, and it should have all the, um, the slide sets, too. You know, I, I have to work pretty hard to put this, this information together, so you know, I hope you're not too bored because you know, the Apocrypha, you know, it's kind of like, um, how do you go through the New Testament, right, by book? And so you only get a little bit. But, you know, we did the history, we did the culture, we did the language, so we know a little bit about this. And now we try to put it together and, and have something to walk away from it. And we say, well, we know something about the Apocrypha. And that's the point. But what are we talking about anyway? That's, that's me. That's, you know about this stuff. The time period we're talking about, I always remind you, it's 430 B.C. to about 5 B.C. Very important time period, right? The birth of philosophy, Alexander the Great, the Hellenization of the world, the birth of the Roman Empire, the Hebraic. Um, I've talked about this before many times. I want to remind you of the Drash to Greek rational worldview. So we're looking at a pagan worldview, even among the Hebrews, this Drash worldview that is moving to a Greek rational worldview. That's the difference we see between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so these intertestamental documents sh reflect that. They show that, that differentiation, that change from Drash thinking to New Testament thinking, which is interesting. And if you remember, we looked at, when we looked at Old Testament documents, we looked at them in terms of, of Peshat, which is the literal look at, literal view, and the Drash view, which is the rabbinic view at the time. So in any case, we've always got to keep these things in mind. This is a new way of thinking, a new way in the world, and that's what we're talking about. So, generally these documents, they're, they're concerning the works of history and literature produced by the Jewish people and attributed to this period. Uh, that means there's more, right? There's Greek documents and other documents attributed to this period too, which is really neat. But we're looking only at these Hebraic documents. Uh, some are Hebraic and some are Aramaic. Most are all Greek or primarily Greek. We also have brought in some other applicable supporting works, and we'll see more of those uh, next week specifically when we conclude. The books, this is our definition of the Apocrypha. That is, the books included in the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament made around 200 B.C., and the Vulgate but they're excluded from the Jewish, and since 1826, from some Protestant canons of the Old Testament. Remember, nobody excluded these works until 1826 except the Jewish canon. So that should be a marker to all of us. That's the Apocrypha. And again, this intertestamental period, this is a list. And so we have worked our way down the list, We've gone through Esther, and Tobit, and Judith, and the additions to Esther, and Elizabeth. I did all these uh, last week. I had to put two together. Uh, and then finally down to the Maccabees. Now, next week we're going to see the other stuff. The other stuff's really neat. But the Maccabees is probably the most important. If you don't read anything, I mean, I think you should read Tobit anyway. Tobit is one. Tobit and Judith are probably the funnest books in the, in the Apocryphal works and maybe the most interesting books in the Old New Testament in terms of entertainment factor. But, you know, when you get down to Maccabees, Maccabees are historical. And look, uh, if you're Protestant, you're doing King James, if you've got your King James at home, okay, then you should be reading one and two. If you're Roman Catholic, you got your Vulgate, or your, you know, your translation, the Douay or the translation of Vulgate, and you're looking at, uh, and if you're Lutheran, you should be reading 1 and 2. But if you're Orthodox and you want to see the whole, you better read 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that's, we'll look through each one of them. We'll see what's in it. In any case, 1 Maccabees. 
Maccabees means hammer. Um, this is a popular name of Judas, the third son of Maccabeus, Matthias. There was, uh, I don't remember if I went through the whole history of this period. I went through a little, yeah, I did go through a little bit of the history. I didn't uh, give you a whole section on the Maccabean period. The Maccabean period was when the when the Hebrew, the Hebrew people revolted against the Seleucid Empire. Remember the Seleucids that was after Alexander the Great? You have the Seleucid Empire, that's that part of Persia that's in the northern area. You have Egypt in the south. You have the Macedonians in Greek, Greece. Well, the Seleucid Empire was a pain to the Hebrews. They were, well, we'll find out how much of a pain in a second. But... If you remember, I told you that the Roman Empire was ascendant, was beginning to become great in this period. And guess who they were, they were breaking down the door of? First the Macedonians, and then the Seleucid Empire. Well, what do you do if you want to revolt, and the Romans are barking at the heels of your enemy? That's when you revolt. That's what they did. The Maccabeans revolted. Now, um, the Maccabeans, this is really interesting because Matthias was, is called a priest. The Maccabees calls him a priest, and Josephus calls him a priest. But as far as we can tell, he was not of the lineage of Aaron. Never claimed to be. And what did you have to be to be a priest? You had to be Levi. of the lineage of Aaron. Also, we can't tell if he was a Levite. As a matter of fact, nowhere does it assert that he was of the lineage of Aaron, nor that he was a Levite. Now, it wasn't uncommon for there to be priests hanging around, you know, that were not necessarily Levites or Aaronites. You know why, right? After the diaspora to Babylon, they came back. And remember ne uh, Ezra and Nehemiah? They had a problem. Who are the priests? Right? They couldn't tell. They had the lineage was hard to tell sometimes because, you know, this guy married this lady or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they had problems telling, so they weren't sure anyway. And then you get guys that are, that are like Matthias, who was allowed to act as priests. So, in any case, you got Matthias, and Matthias was claimed, claimed, and we'll see, claimed to be a priest, and... The book was written in Hebrew about 108 B.C., soon afterwards translated into Greek. The Hebrew text was seen by Jerome. Jerome was one of the early fathers, the apostolic fathers, but it's now lost. But it is a historical account of Jewish history from about 175 B.C. to 135 B.C., during which the Jews of Palestine fought for and gained their freedom from the Greek the Seleucid Empire. And remember, you know, we call them a Seleucid, right? Seleucid Empire, they're Greeks. The Egyptian Empire, Greeks. The Macedonian Empire, Greeks. I always worry that our teachers forgot to tell us this, right? You know, you hear Seleucid and you think, who are these guys? They're Greeks. In any case, the Maccabeans revolted and they did a great job. They gained their independence. They took all of the area plus some that had been historically uh, Israel and Judah. And they forced the people to convert to Judaism. If you remember, I told you in the Old Testament period, there was kind of a hands-off attitude that, hey, live and let live. You know, you're here, we're here, we're all buds, right? And that's what you see in the Torah because it said, welcome the stranger, you know, leave in the field for the stranger, for the alien, etc., etc. We see a change in that because they believed that the diaspora occurred. They were sent away from Israel because they had acclimated with the people. They had allowed those evil non-Jewish people to hang around in their country. So guess what they did? In this period, they said, that's not going to happen anymore. You're, they're going to force them to be a Jew or force them out. And they did. So this is how the Edomites, and I think I mentioned this before, Herod was an Edomite. Herod's father was an Edomite. He became the overseer under the uh, 
basically under the Romans after this period, or did I say that right? Yeah, Edomites. He became an overseer under the Greeks. I don't have a whole history here, so I'm just going off my, 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 my memory and not my notes. But in any case, Herod was an Edomite whose family was forced to convert that became the king of Israel, basically mm -hmm. after the Maccabean line. And so, if you remember, Micah, for example, Malachi says that no Edomite will enter will ever be allowed into the sanctuary, will ever be allowed to be part of the Jewish people. But yet, Herod was. That's an irony. But in any case, basically, First Maccabees is about how Jonathan, uh, well, basically how the, how the revolt, how the revolt went, away, went about with Matthias and with his sons. He had seven sons. All the sons and Matthias were killed, one after the other. You have Simon, and Jonathan and then Simon. Simon. Simon was the last one, the only one who produced progeny, at least as far as we know. In those days, uh, who knows? They might have had progeny and then, you know, uh, it was not uncommon for you just to kill off your brother's progeny so that your children would then be king or would ascend. So in any case, uh, Jonathan and Simon were made high priests and king over the Jewish people. Do you know what that means? You know what it means when you're made high priest and king over the Jewish people? It means you're the Messiah. They were declared the Messiah, both of them, but they died. The problem with the Jewish Messiah is the Jewish Messiah was not supposed to die. He was supposed to bring freedom to the Jewish people, and these guys did. They brought freedom from the Seleucid Empire. They basically made them a kingdom again. But... In each, they die. Also, let's see how much detail I mean. I guess I'm doing some good detail on this. Um, basically, when when Jonathan was declared high priest and king, which means he was the Messiah, you notice he wasn't an Aaronite, so he couldn't be the high priest, right? Did I say anything about them being of the house of David either? <laughs> so they couldn't be the king, right? When they declared Jonathan the king and high priest, that caused the split of the Jewish sects. So the Jewish sects at this time split into three. The Essenes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Didn't you ever ask your Sunday school teacher where these guys came from? Came from this period. I mentioned this before. The reason they split was because the Essenes said, the Essenes were basically the current high priest, and when they named Jonathan as high priest, the current high priest who was of the lineage of Aaron and a Levite said, guess what? This is heresy. We're getting out of Dodge. So he took most of the priests and the Levites and left and created the Essene community. And so the Essenes were that community. That's where they came from. We believe that the first Essene leader was the high priest. Uh, Historically hard to do, but we got some good evidence of that, especially from Maccabees and also from Josephus. So, the Sadducees were the groups of priests and Levites that said, Jonathan's okay with us. So they stuck. Those are the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the group that said, hey, we run the synagogues. We're not crazy like the Essenes. We're not dumping it all and going home. We're going to stay here where we're cozy and happy. That's the Pharisees. So basically the Pharisees and the Sadducees accepted Jonathan to some degree as high priest and king. But he wasn't, and he shouldn't have been. And his brother likewise was declared high priest and king and Messiah. So do you remember the comment that Christ makes that in every generation you Pharisees are looking for a Messiah? Mm -hmm. Guess what? In every generation they had a Messiah. The absolute truth is in every generation